Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. I'm Paula Lance. I'm a professor here in the Ford School of Public Policy and also the Associate Dean for Academic Affairs. And I'm really thrilled to welcome all of you here, those who are in the audience here, and also the people who are viewing us online in real time. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, our program today is made possible by generous support from the Dr. Gilbert Oman and Martha Darling Health Policy Fund. And as many of you are aware, I assume uh, September is National Suicide Prevention Awareness Month. So let me start with a few numbers and statistics for you. There are about 45,000 suicides a year in the United States. That is 120 per day. There are over 1,400 suicides in the state of Michigan every year, and that is actually above the national average. Suicide is the 10th leading cause of death. Out of hundreds of causes of death, let me repeat, it's the 10th leading cause of death overall, and it's the second leading cause of death for young people between the age of 10 and 24. There are disparities in suicide by many different kinds of social characteristics. For example, suicide is the number one cause of death among LGBT youth who are overall four times more likely to attempt suicide and, than other adolescents and young adults. Depression is the number one cause of suicide. Over 16 million people a year in the United States live with clinical depression and it's the number one cause of disability in the United States. And depression is only one of many different kinds of mental health issues and problems that affect people and their families. And as all of us know, mental health issues affect everyone. There's no family that has not been touched somehow by depression, suicide, and other mental health problems. In public policy, we admittedly tend to focus on numbers and populations, communities, institutions, and systems. It's important because that's the beauty and the strength of policy, right? Through policy interventions, we can efficiently affect a large number of people sometimes. But also, the experiences of real people, their real lives, and their families often get lost in the numbers, in the data, in the research evidence. So today, we do want to talk about mental health policy, but in a way that acknowledges, respects, and honors the millions of individuals and their families who are affected by depression, suicide, and other mental health issues. And to do that, I'm gonna start with a list. Number one, ice cream. Number two, water fights. Number three, staying up past your bedtime and being allowed to watch TV. Number four, the color yellow. Number five, things with stripes. Number six, roller coasters. Number seven, people falling over. Number eight, my favorite, chocolate. Number nine, kind old people who are weird and don't smell unusual. <laughs> I'm jumping now. Number 1002, when you learn something about someone that surprises you and makes perfect sense at the same time. One million, listening to a record for the first time. Those of you who have seen the play Every Brilliant Thing know that I'm reading the list from that play. The interactive play, Every Brilliant Thing, is playwright Duncan McMillan's poignant autobiographical story about growing up with a depressed, suicidal mother whom he unsuccessfully tried to make happy by creating a list of every brilliant or wonderful thing in the world. Let's watch a very short clip from this play. Thanks. after her first attempt. A list of everything brilliant about the world. Everything worth living for. Number one. Ice cream. Number two. Water fights. Number three. Staying up past your bedtime and being allowed to watch TV. If you get through your entire life without ever once feeling crushingly depressed, then you probably haven't been paying attention. <laughs> <laughs> when Ray Charles sings the word you, and it sounds like it's coming out of someone else's voice. We all used to just 
crowd around the piano and howl it like wolves. Mm. Children with depressed parents, they have a heightened reactivity to stress because children with depressed parents, they are left to fend for themselves. But the real risk, as I perceived it, was that I would one day feel the same as my mum and want to take the same course of action because along with the anger and the incomprehension was an absolute crystal clear understanding of why someone would want to take their life. We were walking through the park, Sam and I, and we got to the middle. And she stopped and bent down, I thought, to do her shoelaces. And I kept on going, and then when I turned around, she looked at me, and she looked me in the eye, and she took my hands, and she said, Will you marry me? <laughs> and I said, yes. Let's kiss later. <laughs> I hope many of you had a chance to see this wonderful play through the uh, recent University of Michigan Musical Society offerings, or also it's available on HBO. If you have on demand on HBO, you can watch it anytime if you haven't seen it yet. Uh, with this personal story as a backdrop and a potential point of focus during our question and answer portion later, I would now like to move on and introduce to you uh, our panel of amazing local uh, policy and clinical experts. So each of our panelists will be making a short presentation and then we'll move to audience questions and comments. Those of you here in the auditorium can write questions on cards that are going to be passed out and those of uh, you who are watching us online, you can tweet in your questions using the hashtag policy talks. So now it is my distinct honor to introduce to you our four panelists in the order that they'll be speaking. And they're sitting in the front row now. They'll remain sitting in the front row um, until the Q&A period and then they'll, they'll all come up front. Our first speaker today is Dr. Michelle Reba. Dr. Reba is a practicing psychiatrist and the director of the psycho-oncology program here at the University of Michigan Comprehensive Cancer Center. She's a clinical professor and associate chair for integrated medical and psychiatric services at the UM Department of Psychiatry. She's a national leader in mental health and she's the immediate past president of the American Psychiatric Association. We also have with us here today Dr. Shirveen Asari. Dr. Sari is also a psychiatrist with training in public health. He's a research investigator with the University of Michigan Department of Psychiatry. His research focuses on the intersection of community mental health and social epidemiology. As a community mental health researcher, he's interested in the relationship between mood disorders and social identities and the social determinants of health and, and depression and mental health issues, such as ethnicity, gender, social class, and places where people live. Dr. Nancy Baum is also here with us today. She's a health policy researcher and the health policy team lead at the Center for Healthcare Research and Transformation, otherwise known as CHART, here in Ann Arbor. She leads CHART's work in the development of health policy projects focused on health reform, health status improvement, and access to healthcare. And we're also fortunate to have with us today Trish Cortez. She's the executive director of the Washtenaw County Community Mental Health, which is the safety net mental health provider serving individuals with serious mental health and developmental disabilities in our county. Trish is a registered nurse with a master's degree in community health nursing, and she brings to our discussion today a wealth of experience and leadership regarding community mental health and so delighted all four of our panelists are with us. Can you please give them a round of applause as Dr. Reba makes her way up to the podium. Thanks so much. Hi, everybody. Uh, and thanks to Paula and Emily for, for inviting us and for doing such a wonderful job in the arrangements. And thank you all for coming. So. Uh, before we really begin this presentation, let me just ask, and I'm already standing, how many of you, uh, either in yourselves or in a family member or, or a close friend or colleague, has had some depression, suffered from some depression? Maybe you could stand up. Okay, thank you. 
So this is a personal topic, right? It's obviously going to, we'll be talking about policy, but this is a very personal topic uh, and very important. So we'll be talking in the next couple of minutes about the significance and prevalence, and then we'll talk about depression and suicide across the life cycle, and if we have time, um, something about treatment options. Well, why is this so important? It's number one um, in terms of depression, and number six in terms of bipolar disorder on the World Health Organization's list of global burdens of diseases for ages 15 to 45, one and six. Uh, depression and bipolar illnesses affect uh, one in six of us, but it touches all six of us. We don't really understand depression and suicide. Uh, many of us don't seek treatment, and even if we do, it may not be the right treatment, and there are tragic uh, consequences um, if, we, if this goes untreated or ignored. The past uh, director of National Institute of Mental Health, Tom Insull, cited depression as the top cause of medical disability. And what about the burden of uh, depression worldwide? Well, it's the largest cause of death by suicide, as uh, Paula mentioned. It's very expensive in terms of human suffering and in, in financial aspects. It costs a lot. and. Uh, we're uh, starting a new workplace mental health uh, program at the Depression Center out at East uh, Ann Arbor, and it impacts on absenteeism and presenteeism. Well, how do you diagnose this? In 1952, we started with the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual right after World War, I, uh, World War II, and we're up to DSM-5, and we classify uh, all the psychiatric conditions in this manual, and we update it regularly. In terms of depression and DSM-5, there are many types of depression. So it's, it's really not easy to diagnose, and there are many. Often we talk about major depressive disorder, and we'll focus on that today. But I wanted you to understand that there are many types of depressions. And with these depressions, they're often a modifier. So here in Michigan, this is a common one, right? Seasonal uh, changes um, that come with, let's say, major depression. And people can also have seasonal problems in the summer as well as in the winter. In terms of bipolar disorders, there are also many types of bipolar disorders and illnesses. So it's complicated not easy to make this diagnosis. And it's also, I want you to understand that it's not just a specific symptom that's pathognomonic for anyone. It ha has to be over a certain uh, course of time. So sometimes somebody comes into the emergency department and we can't make the diagnosis just on seeing somebody in a snapshot. We need to see and understand somebody's life course and understand them over a period of time. But with people who have depression, often they have a depressed mood, they have a loss of interest or pleasure, and sometimes in children they're irritable. So depression looks different depending on how old you are, circumstance, and other medical conditions, and we'll talk about that in a, in a moment. In terms of symptoms of depression, uh, one can have these problems, and there's a mnemonic for it, it's called SIGI CAPS, so that you can remember sleep disturbance, sometimes people sleep more or less, they may feel guilty, they may have too much energy or a lack of energy, so it's very variable, and not everybody has to have all of these problems, but often people have many of them. What about the epidemiology? Paula mentioned some, but in terms of lifetime risk for women, it's 20%, 10% for men. Um, at any one time, about 5 to 10% of women may have depression, less for men. There's a gender distribution, 2 to 1 women to men in, in adulthood, and we'll talk about children and adolescents. There's a high concordance for monozygotic twins. 50 to 75 percent, and uh, also if you're in a family with somebody who has depression, you have a higher risk. 
So let's talk about in terms of uh, life course, in terms of children, there are children who are depressed. We're understanding more and more that youth, depression starts in youth. Um, and in children, it's an equal distribution from, for girls and boys. And it's higher for children who have co-occurring medical conditions, such, such as diet, type 1 diabetes, for example. There's a different acronym for depression in children. It's, this one can be used, DUMPS. And so, so it looks different in children. It's hard, you don't use the same sort of uh, symptoms. But it does have a youthful um, beginning, and usually the peak of depression is between 15 and 24, so our thought is to get it earlier, treat it, and the quality of life improves, but often there are delays in treatment and diagnosis, and there's misdiagnosis. What about adolescents? And we see many, many adolescents coming to our emergency department. Well, in early adolescents, about 8%, and by 18, about one in four adolescents have had an episode of depression. Up until the age of 12 or 13, it's equal distribution between girls and boys, and then around 12 or 13, girls go up higher. It's probably related to some endocrinological or other uh, mediators. And then what about late life depression? Well, about 20% in community samples, and then the first onset of depression, we often see it after the age of 60, and we can see it even more with those who have co-occurring medical conditions, such as heart disease, uh, post-myocardial infarction, diabetes, post-stroke, and neurodegenerative illnesses such as Alzheimer's or Parkinson's. What about death by suicide? Um, this is a public health problem. Many of you have probably heard the NPR this morning or this afternoon that was about suicide in veterans. Um, many die by suicide each year. Um, uh, it's probably underreported, um, and I think Paula gave some of the statistics about this. But we see it, and we've had several unfortunate suicides in youth here in Ann Arbor in the last couple of months. We're very fortunate to have prominent researchers here at the School of Public Health who organize and run the Healthy Minds study, which looks at campuses across the United States and many countries. Daniel Eisenberg and Sarah Ketchum Lipson, are, are, Daniel is the PI for this, and they try to intervene early, and they are doing such innovative work, working with uh, others such as Cheryl King, trying to identify and outreach students in their dorm, room, dorm rooms and working with RAs and trying to um, target certain populations that we know who are at risk um, in the college and graduate school years. And this is just one example, I think Paula mentioned that as well, the LGBT group. Um, in terms of late life depression and suicide, elderly white men have a lot of good things about them and for them, but not in terms of suicide rates, unfortunately. They have amongst the highest rates of suicides, about five to six um, greater than others. Um, uh, the majority of, of these folks have seen a primary care doctor in the last month, and uh, so it's very important for us to think about how to intervene and to ask about this. And as Paula mentioned, most suicidal patients have a diagnosable depression. These are some of the suicide risk factors, and there are, let me just read them out because it's important, depression, substance abuse or, in, or dependence, physical decline, illness, terminal illness, pain, loss of independence, and I have to stop. <laughs> and there are many treatments, so we can talk about that. But psychotherapy in combination with pharmacotherapy and augment with these other exercise and behavioral aspects are very important. So let me stop and thank you very much.
<coughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, uh, in my five to seven minutes, I want to talk about uh, three mechanisms how social factors influence mental health, particularly depression. So, and most of our research understanding fr comes from two studies, one national community survey and one world mental health survey, both conducted by uh, Kessler, who was here in Michigan and is now at Harvard. So, uh, of course, genetic predisposition has a role and many other uh, factors like physical health, but my talk is focusing on economic and social and public, how social factors can influence distribution at the level of society. And please make a distinction between determinants or social determinants of depression from social determinants of use of services for depression. I am exclusively looking at or explaining social determinants of the prevalence. Uh, starting from the outcome being depression, uh, most of the social determinants, like how we get exposed uh, to a social risk factor, like trauma, rape, fear of violence. Uh, so the first one is a stress, which its distribution is socially determined. The second one is social support, the type of job that you are performing in determines do you have social support or not, and many others like education and income. And also the place that you live, like physical and social aspects of your environment. Then there is a personal asset which comes following the social determinants of health, like uh, do you have a high agency or sense of control over life? That comes from education. If you have higher education and you get higher pay, you have higher agency to control your life. And also, do you get a good e e emotion regulation? Again, each year of sitting at a school, having the chance to go to school, increases our emotion regulation potential. Then, uh, the pattern of our time use, how much privileged life we have to be able to spend some time to gar do gardening, walk, uh, and other uh, behaviors, including how much our sleep is influenced. That is a social a patterning of uh, a risk factor of depression. So by here, I have two clusters, one, social determinants like uh, social exposures and resources and one personal assets both being determined by our education income employment and marital status and other social resources which themselves are under influence of these factors that i have listed here education quality do we live in new york detroit or ann arbor determines our education quality, that determines our emotion regulation. Employment, if you are living in Detroit, lower chance of employment if you are a black male. So that has uh, implication for the pattern of all, many of those factors from time use, social support, exposure. Then does our uh, policies, which if you need money, are there in place to lend or they would discriminate you against and they would not give enough lending that you need so you cannot borrow money. Or public transportation, do you have public transportation to go on to, to work so you can have lower financial distress? So you see all these po policies have implication for depression through a number of constructs. And of course, they are determined by public policies. So this is, the, the whole message here is not for who gets treatment for depression, but who gets depression, determinants is mostly social, and it is a social patterning. 
This, so this is mechanism one. So our exposure and our resources is different dis depending on who we are, <laughs> our ranking. The second one is that how much we can use our resources and re use them to become tangible health outcomes depend on who we are. Uh, with almost no exception, social determinants have a strongest effect for white men in United States. So there are very few exceptions like religion and social support. But if it is an economic or social resource, that path from having access to protecting yourself depends on the intersection of race and gender and place. Um, so it is our group membership or what part of the society are we located determines not only the access, but can we use that resource to protect ourselves. So this is mechanism two. And then the third mechanism is that because of like mistrust or discrimination. So th th this is continuation of that, sorry. This is, uh, and there, there are considerable empirical evidence suggesting that education, employment, social environment, self-rated health do not become tangible health outcomes depending on who you are in the United States. And then this is mechanism number three, which is because depression differently correlates with those factors which are important. Like depression is correlated with higher stigma if you are black male. So that means depression is more consequential if you are black male. Or also dysfunctional belief about self, others, and future. Uh, from some mechanisms, blacks with depression uh, can maintain high hope, maybe through social support or religiosity. So what, a white individual with uh, depression would have lower level of hope compared to black counterpart. So you see this third mechanism of how society shapes our incidence, prevalence, and consequence of depression is society shapes also correlates of depression. So this is the third mechanism. So I stop here. Thank you very much. <laughs> Hi, everybody. It's nice to see some friendly faces in the audience. Um, I'm not going to use slides today. You can just look at this general slide while I'm talking. Um, I think it's really important to start with those really dramatic statistics about prevalence and um, our understanding about these um, mechanisms that lead to depression. Some of the other things that matter, though, are some of these um, public policies that Paula referred to early on. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, insurance policies and uh, the way we've structured things using insurance and um, give you a little bit of information um, about some things we're doing locally, and that'll lead into Trish's talk. So um, I'm going to give you a little bit of history of some relatively recent, in the last few decades, um, federal laws that have an effect on people's abilities to actually use the services that they need when they have depression and anxiety and other mental health issues. So uh, in the late 90s, um, and then again in about 2008, we had two federal laws that were passed that we refer to today as the parity laws. And these were laws that were put in place in order to combat a problem with that people who um, needed mental health uh, services um, faced when they um, understood that these services were very expensive, needed to use insurance to, to pay for them. Um, and then once they looked closely at their insurance policies, recognized that the benefits for mental health services and for substance use services were far inferior to the benefits for physical health services. So for a very long time, insurance um, benefits that might pay 
all but 80 or 90 percent of the cost of a physical health benefit, only paid something like 50 percent of the cost for mental health services. Uh, insurance policies that didn't have an annual limit or didn't have a lifetime limit for benefit for physical health services did have those kinds of limits for mental health services. And so this was really problematic. And this is really a result of our misunderstanding about mental health services being really different um, from physical health services and people's um, body that includes both their brain and the rest of their body together. And so parity laws were really important. Uh, they were passed and they, they um, made giant leaps forward by saying, if insurance policies offer mental health services, then they have to do it at the same level that they do for physical health services. So you can't have a limit, a lifetime limit on your mental health services if you don't have it on physical health services. That didn't, though, require insurance policies to include mental health benefits. So for a very long time, especially uh, skinnier policies, policies that were offered by small employers, um, policies that people were buying as individuals, um, had very little, if any, mental health and substance use um, services in their policies. So in, in uh, 2010, the Affordable Care Act was passed. And in the Affordable Care Act, um, there was some expansion of those parity laws to cover um, more policies. So now almost all policies have to abide by the, um, the rules that were put in place through the parity laws. And the Affordable Care Act said in the essential health benefits, which most of you have probably heard about, uh, it includes the requirement that mental health and substance use services and treatment for those, so for those you know, the identification of those problems um, are included. And um, so most large employers who are offering benefits were offering sort of richer packages and they already had uh, mental health and substance use services to some extent in them. Um, and so the essential health benefits then required those uh, plans that were sold on the marketplace, that individuals were buying, and um, eventually um, many other plans to include a requirement for that. So, so, so that's sort of the history of where we are in terms of insurance um, policies. When Medicaid was expanded in the state of Michigan, which it was in 30 one or two other states in the nation, um, 600,000 plus more people were covered by Medicaid than prior to the Affordable Care Act's um, provision to expand Medicaid, the Supreme Court saying that states had a choice, Michigan deciding to go ahead and expand. Over 600,000 peop 600, people uh, more are enrolled. These are people who had been uninsured for a very long time, most of them. And so you can imagine there's a lot of pent up demand for services, including mental health and substance use services. So all of a sudden there's a huge demand for, a uh, greater demand for mental health and substance use services. It's terrific that more people are covered, but it's really important to understand that insurance coverage is not equal to access to services. Insurance coverage is really important because services are expensive, but it's not enough. And in the world of mental health and substance use, uh, unfortunately, we have a real shortage of providers. And so this is not a problem that's specific to Michigan. This is a problem across the nation. Um, but when you have a shortage of providers, then it's, it's complicated as to why we have such a shortage, a shortage of psychiatrists. We have a shortage of uh, inpatient beds um, to treat people for mental health issues. Uh, and, and we can go into some of the reasons for the shortages a little bit later, um, if you're interested. So you have a shortage of providers, you have greater demand, and so we have, do we have maybe even a bigger problem than we had before? It's hard to say. Um, lots of ways that we think about trying to address this great demand for services. One of the things that we talk about a lot in the mental health world is something called integration, integrated services. And this is the idea that, um, you know, mental health, um, some people have mild or moderate needs for mental health services and other people have more severe mental health issues or substance use issues. Um, there's a real continuum. Some of, those, some of those needs can be met in primary care if primary care providers are trained um, in order to address the needs of people with mild to moderate mental illness. Um, that would be one way to sort of extend our specialty providers who we don't have enough of. So we talk a lot about this. There's actually 
decades of evidence that um, this kind of integrated care that sometimes we call, uh, there, there are other names um, for it, co-located and, and coordinated care, um, that, that, that there are really good health outcomes as a result of this kind of delivery of care. Uh, what we don't do very well is pay for integrated um, mental health and primary care services. So for example, um, it would be a beautiful thing, it is a beautiful thing in some places in a primary care clinic where they, there will be a psychologist or a psychiatrist in an office right next to the room where somebody is have, talking to their primary care provider. And their primary care provider can take them by the elbow and, give, and, and do what's called a warm handoff and say, in our primary care setting, we've identified this need. And instead of somebody, giving somebody a referral for, for mental health services and hoping that they show up weeks later when they finally get an appointment, if you just walk them right next door and hand them off to a professional, um, it's a, it's a nice way for people to um, access services. It helps with that stigma. They don't have to go and wait in a waiting room um, that they're not comfortable with, et cetera. So integrating care is a really nice idea. But when the psychiatrist and the primary care provider are having a consultation that takes 15 minutes or a half an hour to talk about this patient, we don't have any good way of paying them for that time. And so if we don't have a great way of paying them for that time where they're doing this curbside consultation one with the other about how best to treat this patient, then we have a problem. So we have evidence that, that this kind of integrated care works, but we, have, um, we don't have a lot of uh, really good solutions about how to pay for it. Integration is um, a hot topic in Michigan. Um, there's something referred to as the 298 um, problem and 298 is the number of the section in the governor's budget, proposed budget, uh, where they use some boilerplate language to say we want to uh, integrate mental health services with the primary care services and other physical health services um, by taking all the dollars that we spend in our public mental health system, which Trish will talk about, and handing them over to one, one take on this, handing them over to the managed care plans who now um, deliver the care for most people who are covered by Medicaid. And so, as you can imagine, um, people uh, who were receiving these services had a very hard time um, understanding how it was that they wouldn't lose their very important providers. You know, you make really solid relationships with providers when you have mental health issues um, for a lot of people, and that was really hard to imagine. And so sort of thrown into this bucket of privatization and um, a, bad, a bad policy idea. So in the state right now, over the last couple of years, we've had uh, lots of stakeholder engagement conversations, lots of um, proposals um, about how we might integrate care, um, and there are still a lot of people who are very opposed to it. Uh, not because they don't think that conceptually, clinically integrated care is good, it is, but you know, just taking the dollars that we typically spend in the community mental health system and giving them to the um, managed care organizations is really controversial. So um, I, will, I will end there and we can talk more about those issues in the discussion. All right, well, thank you. Um, very excited to be here. Um, super excited that we are talking about these issues. Um, these are really, really important issues. So I wanna thank Paula for, um, for inviting me to come here today and Emily for um, your appreciate, I appreciate how much you hounded me to make sure I got my stuff in. So thank you for putting up with me. Um, so I'm gonna be talking a little bit about what's happening here in our own backyard. Um, does anybody know anything really about community mental health? If you do, please raise your hand. Okay, that's what I thought. So let's start with uh, what community mental health does. Community mental health is um, our safety net mental health provider um, for, you know, in, in our state. There's 46 CMHs in the state of Michigan. And essentially, we serve people who are low income, Medicaid and um, who have kind of deep end needs. So adults with serious, uh, serious mental illness, youths with serious emotional disturbances, and youths and uh, adults with intellectual developmental disabilities, and certainly also individuals that have a co-occurring uh, uh, condition. 
And what's the different about CMH, and it's a little bit talking uh, kind of what both Dr. Asari and what Nancy, is that mental health provides a much broader array of service because of the exact issues that Dr. Asari talked about with social determinants of health. So a typical coverage for mental health is you see a doc, you can see a nurse, get an injection, you have some therapy, and that's, and, and that's pretty much the, the basic package. Community mental health, one of, the, um, one of the bread and butter services that we provide is case management. Because uh, one of the things that we talk about in the community mental health world is that, is that the medical model is necessary, but it's not sufficient. In community mental health, we, we, we have to get people housed. That is a form of treatment. We need to get people on, uh, secure with their food needs. We need to do a whole array of, of issues to address the, what Dr. Sari had on his slide before we can even get to treatment. So that is, that is one of the fundamental differences in, that, um, in what we do versus what traditional insurance plans cover, in addition to lots of other services um, like uh, people who need residential support, people who need uh, support with getting employed, people who have a whole host of, of, of issues that need to be addressed. Community Mental Health also, we are 24-7, 365 mobile crisis. Um, we respond to any crisis in the community. We also are, uh, because of the reasons I just discussed, also are very integrated in a lot of other social service systems. We are the mental health provider in the jail. We staff the mental health court. We are in the primary care safety clinics helping with the integrated care efforts that Nancy just talked about. And the list kind of goes on and on from there. So um, one of the big impacts that happened to us in the last couple of years is that uh, concurrent with the implementation of Medicaid expansion, which here in the state of Michigan is called Healthy Michigan, HMP, Healthy Michigan Plan, um, the state made a decision um, around financing. And what the state did at that time is concurrent to the implementation of HMP, they uh, took about $200 million out of the, out of the uh, CMH system statewide, which for us was about a 60% reduction in our funding. And it was, it was not the Medicaid, but it was what we call our state general funds, and those are, were precious at the time because those are not as regulated as Medicaid is, and those were the dollars that we had to do flexible, creative things like have a psychiatrist in a safety net clinic, like doing, uh, paying for jail services. Let, and most importantly for us is that we kind of, anybody who kind of met the diagnostics and functional limitations, we served everyone blind to payer and they got case management and they got assertive community treatment services and the list goes on and on. So when this funding went away, it was uh, an extremely challenging time because at that time what we had to do is that we had to actually discharge people who maybe just had Medicare Medicare does not cover all those services. And so we needed to go through and start looking to see who can we hand these individuals off with, with not really super great resources and issues, um, like as Nancy talked about. So what happened is that we ended up no longer being able to be the safety net provider for all. This kind of shows you in, uh, in 2014, we served roughly just about, you know, uh, 650 ish or more um, individuals who did not have a form of Medicaid that we paid for their services out of our general funds. Now we are down to about 115 who are now currently in our system and we're holding on to them because they're so ill um, that really the, it, is, it would be like an emergent or urgent situation if we did not serve them. So we've held on to the deepest end people because out of, out of sheer necessity. We've had to close our front door and so that it not, unless people meet an urgent emergent need, we cannot bring them in and we have to try to refer them to the best resource we can find in the community. So this gives you an idea of kind of the impact that this has had. What we're seeing locally in our trends, um, we're, we're seeing that, um, that you know, there, and, and I also wanna say that Healthy Michigan, we are now serving roughly about 700 individuals on Healthy Michigan in the CMH system. So it has been a wonderful resource because, because on Healthy Michigan, they do get the full array of services covered under other traditional forms of Medicaid. 
But what we're seeing is the blue line is uh, people who are actually Medicaid and with us. We serve them. We know them. We, they, we hang on to them. That our inpatient is going up a little bit. But what we're seeing kind of exploding is that there is another population, mostly healthy Michigan, who are, are showing up in ERs and our inpatient, uh, our inpatient rates we're seeing is just kind of skyrocketing year over year. Our corrections data, this is uh, from our Washington County Jail. Um, again, the blue line, you can see over, you know, over, over the, the years, we've kind of kept it steady of what individuals who are ours um, are also in our county jail. But again, we're seeing this other trend of another population that has now exceeded the number of people who are actually enrolled in community mental health. So we're seeing that people are landing in other places. This is a slide from the Washington County uh, Public Health Department. There's a lot of information on there, but I'm just going to point out that um, the startling increase of, we are, of, of suicides that we're seeing in, in our young and our youth um, between the ages of 15 and 24, um, we are seeing in the last six years or so a 433% increase in the number of uh, completed suicides in our county. So, as we have been experiencing all this, and when we uh, uh, received our funding cuts back in 14-15, uh, um, some of the things that we did in our community and um, it was that we needed to, to really do a thorough analysis of what are we going to do, how are we going to handle this. Um, so, I reached out to our good friends and colleagues over at CHART, um, and Nancy actually was one of the ones, uh, was one of the staff at CHART that helped us do this to do kind of a deep um, analysis of um, gaps around substance abuse and, and mental health services in our in our community. Uh, Washington County Sheriff uh, Sheriff Jerry Clayton uh, and I also because of the intersect between our two worlds um, is not insignificant. Um, also hosted a sequential intercept mapping um, workshop, two day workshop, where we had everyone from kind of the uh, public safety, justice, mental health, substance abuse, housing, and others um, worlds all come together to really look at, um, you know, in every single kind of intercept where an individual is having some interaction with law enforcement, et cetera, um, what are our resources, what are our gaps, and what do we need to do? And so we conducted that. In addition, our two major health systems um, in our uh, community did a joint needs assessment, what's called UNITE, um, and they also um, did their assessment. The overwhelming conclusion of all of it is mental health, substance abuse is the top priority in this community. And what we are also experiencing is that the, uh, the community capacity to serve individuals with, be with behavioral health issues is very limited. And this is something that we are seeing, as Nancy said, it's not just a Washington County issue, it's a state and, and national issue that we are facing. So part of the, the consequences of um, these limited resources, what the chart report also found is that what it's leading to is there's a delay in people getting to services, whether it's outpatient, inpatient, um, substance abuse, et cetera. We are seeing that our extended wait times in our psychiatric emergency, uh, our, psych, our psych departments are um, literally, uh, uh, University of um, Michigan or Michigan Medicine now um, is now, they're actually having to look at the physical plant because they can't have, they have so many bodies that are coming in right now. Um, we're also seeing a discharge of getting people off inpatient units because we don't have that, that the, the most appropriate step or, or, or can't access the, the, the most appropriate kind of step down for that individual. And we are asking our community providers who historically CMH has taken care of these kind of deeper end people, we are asking primary care physicians and, and other providers that haven't really typically worked with individuals who are experiencing schizophrenia, for example. And so we are really pushing uh, our community partners to really uh, kind of expand their, you know, their, their scope of practice. So I think the, the, the major conclusion is that we are really at a point where we need to strategically expand our, our community-based care across the full continuum of services for, for mental health and substance abuse. And you know, one of the things that has been pop, popped up in, that, in the chart um, analysis is that we really need to do a better job of, um, of, of having a comprehensive community-based crisis care program that can take people, you know, people who just need to walk in, short stays, find out what they need and get them to the right place. That has uh, been one of the number one priorities that have come out of all of these analysis. 
Um, with our uh, sequential intercept uh, workshop that we did, again, the same themes coming up. We need, we need to expand our crisis response strategies as a community. We need to um, expand our substance abuse treatment. Um, another piece that came out of that because of the nature of that workshop is that we also need to uh, make sure that first responders, such as law enforcement, such as paramedics, also need to know how to address or at least it, it identify that there is a mental health crisis before them and not necessarily you know, whatever else it may be. And so we've done uh, a lot of training, particularly with the Sheriff's Office of training um, all 150 Sheriff deputies on uh, how to manage a, a mental health um, uh, crisis. Um, and then also expanding kind of the use of peer supports, which has really been um, a very effective way of um, kind of uh, addressing some of these needs through peers with lived experience. So our kind of local reality is that the, there's kind of a perfect storm that's happened here in Washington County. We've got an opioid epidemic. I think just about everybody knows about that. We are seeing increases in suicide. We are seeing uh, increases in um, inpatient crisis services. Um, we have a capacity issue in the community. We've got funding restraints like, we've had, like we haven't seen before. But we've also had, um, you know, that our community has really analyzed the situation. And I do believe that we are really at a point right now where we are, are going to be transitioning out of reactive mode and really going into um, more like proactive strategic planning together as a community. Some of the advantages um, that I think is, is unique to Washington County is that we are really a uh, community rich with partnerships. Um, so we are now working with leveraging those partnerships, working with all our, 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 our community providers, our housing network, et cetera, because this is really kind of a, uh, you know, it's going to take a village to really start addressing some of this. We are all trying to um, expand our, our, as we, we also need to make sure that we are aligning our efforts that right now, whether you're in the substance abuse world or mental health or you're part of a health system, everybody's trying to try to uh, address the same issues. Um, so there's a lot of moving parts, but we need to make sure that we are doing those in concert. And so that's what um, we are also um, discussing. Education, that's part of what this whole event is about, right? So we need to get a lot of education and advocacy around these issues. We have started talking about a community-based crisis program. Um, again, uh, we're the right, right service at the right time. That's not necessarily need to be in the jail or the emergency room. That work is underway. Um, as well as try, trying to kind of stabilize the system by doing more integrated care efforts, for example, um, and really trying to make sure that we are kind of, um, you know, doing a better job of, of helping. We've have the, we've have, we have the historic knowledge and expertise around some of these issues from, from, you know, our perspective, but then how do we help our partners kind of expand what they're doing? So, I already talked, these are the things that we're doing. We are doing a lot of law enforcement training. We are uh, doubling down our efforts in terms of our, our partnerships with our schools. We have um, in Ann Arbor Public Schools alone, we lost nine youths last year to either overdose or suicide. That is a startling uh, high um, uh, statistic. Um, and, no, and I think one of the most important things we need to do is just a full blown, everybody needs to get on board with kind of busting the stigma around mental illness and really taking it is that the brain is an organ just like your heart, just like your lungs, just like anything else. And we need to stop treating it like it's something different. That's it. Thank you. I'd like to invite our panelists to come up front. They were all under extreme time constraints and packed a lot into their short presentation. So please join me again in thanking them for working under uh, challenging circumstances. We've covered a lot of ground. Um, and I see that there's been a lot of audience questions coming in. So as our um, students, sort through them. Uh, I would like to just give them another moment. I'm going to start off our Q&A session by just asking any of the panelists, you don't all have to respond to this, but I don't know if any of the panelists uh, had an opportunity to see the play Every Brilliant Thing and just want to share any reactions um, to any aspect of this performance that resonated with you and the work that you do in the area of mental health. Um, I will start. Is this on? I don't think it's on. Um. 
hit it. <laughs> yeah. Um, I can talk loud. I did have the opportunity. Thanks, Sherman. Um, to see uh, to see the, the the show at the um, Parker Miller Theater on North Campus. Um, and so, as most of you probably know, this is a theater in the round, and it's very inviting. And the other thing that's very um, inviting about it is that the, the show engaged the audience. I'm not sure you can get this from the clip, but the show engaged the, the audience constantly throughout the entire show, almost. There was somebody from the audience on the stage, and some of them there for a really long time. And I started thinking about, you know, this is a really interesting metaphor for the way we need to address mental illness. It really requires our community. It requires our family and our friends and professionals and everybody, you know, addressing mental illness is not a one-man show, even though this was a one-man show. So that was, the, that was sort of my, um, my thoughts about it. Thank you. Dr. Reba? You know, it's one of the uh, hardest things for a child to have a parent with any illness, right, uh, including a mental illness. I was thinking, I work in, at the cancer center, and we have camps, summer camps, for children whose parents have cancer. And they can go for years to these camps. We don't have that for children whose parents have psychiatric problems. Think about it. Yeah. That's great. Well, I'm now going to turn to our students uh, who will be uh, asking the, the questions that people in the audience have sent in. Again, I want to remind our viewers who are watching online that you can tweet your questions into hashtag policy talks. Uh, we have two students here with us today. They're going to introduce themselves, and they're being assisted by Professor Natasha Pilkowskis as well in uh, sorting through uh, and organizing your questions. So thank you. All right. Good, good evening now. Uh, thank you so much for being here. Uh, my name is Nadine Jouad. I'm a senior in the BA program uh, studying public policy uh, with a concentration in women's health policy. Uh, the first question from the audience is, it seems that there is a tension between wanting to diagnose people with official DSM-defined conditions so that their conditions and challenges can be seen as legitimate, but simultaneously wanting to avoid further stigmatizing these individuals by labeling them. How do you personally reconcile with this, and how can policymakers help? Anyone? <laughs> That's a great question. <laughs> Just to make it clear that I'm not a psychiatrist. Uh, Paula uh, was kind enough to say I'm a psychiatrist, but I'm yeah. a primary health care physician. Oh, I'm sorry. So I okay. not practice and just as research. So if I didn't respond anything related to diagnosis because I'm not a practitioner. So that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> He's dodging a question that I know he could answer. Uh, why, why are we talking about stigma and, and trying to have a correct diagnosis for somebody. I guess that's a that's an important question. You know, you wouldn't want to have an oncologist treat you without having the right diagnosis based on pathology and radiographs and you know testing. And so, you know, even very fundamentally talking about diagnosis, you know, it's an interesting issue. You know, we we don't you know we use DSM as used by all mental health practitioners, not just psychiatrists. And the idea is for us to have a common language so that, you know, if you come to see me in one building, but you go to see somebody in another building, and we look at the records, we can understand what the course of treatment is or, 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 or you know, how do we treat to, to remission of that problem. Um, and so we're trying to you know, we use this to try to help people, but I, I guess others think of this as stigmatizing. So that's a really important question, I think, of, as a policy issue, and would be it'd be really interesting to have a conversation about this with others in the room, if you're interested. Great, thanks. Hi, I'm Katie Allen, and I'm a, a dual master's in the School of Public Health and the Ford School, and I'm also interested in um, women's health um, issues. So um, this is a slightly different, not quite related question, but Dr. Baum talked about how mental health issues often require a different kind of care than physical health issues. Um, for moderate to severe cases of things like depression, is treatment seen as something that can be done effectively in a certain number of months, or is depression more of an across-the-lifetime issue? 
Probably best answered by clinicians. Yeah. <laughs> um, the idea is to try to treat it early and to prevent recurrences. We're not doing a very good job with this prevention, and especially as we're talking about services and funding, that's really the issue because you know, we're seeing more and more people coming into the emergency department, not just for psychiatric problems, but for all conditions, because they don't have the money to go to primary care, uh, to get testing for other, uh, for all sorts of medical problems, and then by the time they have a problem, it's very severe. So, you know, we're trying to prevent recurrences, but in fact, there are many illnesses in psychiatry just like in other conditions where we think of it as a chronic condition, but we want to try to prevent, you know, severe episodes of that condition. That, that's really the treat, the goal to try to ha improve quality of life for everybody. And uh, knowing some of the literature, there is a literature saying that after three hits of depression, the biology changes significantly, much more than the hit number one and hit number two. So if someone has experienced three episodes, the risk of recurrence is just disproportionately higher in future compared to two episodes. You know, uh, just to say, you know, often we see young people not getting the right diagnosis and, you know, they turn to drugs or alcohol to treat their fidgetiness or hyperactivity or mood to try to make themselves feel better or put on, you know, drugs because they're misdiagnosed where psychotherapy or other treatments like exercise, sleep, you know, might change in diet. And poverty, you know, we were talking about homelessness, poverty, what, what impact that is on children who have to, you know, not be able to see regular teachers or, or get educated. So, you know, these, all these determinants really impact on, you know, people having three episodes. What we're trying to prevent is having people having three episodes, trying to, trying to help them earlier on in their uh, life. Yes, there, there is something called telescoping effect, which means if you are a vulnerable, a member of a vulnerable population, like a minority or not that much access, the same disorder would result in worse conditions. So like a telescope, you would transition faster to the worst outcome. So that is why uh, social determinants are also important after development of depression. Okay, uh, so that was a good segue into the next question. So there's a little bit of context to it. Uh, right now there's a national push uh, to recognize Middle East and North African uh, checkbox as a point of census data. Uh, it's more specific to the state of Michigan because southeastern Michigan um, has a large population of Middle Eastern and North African persons. Uh, I guess the question would be then, uh, if we are classifying a large population in this community as white, uh, how do we look at their trends, uh, especially with many of them coming from war-torn situations? How do we look at their trends over a long uh, span of time? And how do we make sure we're servicing those people as a marginalized identity and not as a homogenized identity? If I can answer that, uh, first, my personal opinion is that that's a wrong decision to count uh, Arab Americans or Middle Easterns as white, because particularly, the, for example, the first generation of immigrants, it's a group of immigrants which means high risk, uh, even if the ethnic backgrounds of uh, centuries ago are sim have some similarities to whites, still the risk profile is totally different. So my answer, very short, is that that's the wrong start to call them white. So, yeah. Sorry, I think I may have said that wrong. So they're pushing to have a Middle Eastern North African checkbox because currently they're white. Yeah, okay, okay. that would be great. Yeah, that so would that, be yeah, that's, step, <laughs> that's a step yeah. forward. Because I, myself, I'm a Middle Eastern and I take uh, white, which uh, makes me very angry. <laughs> and, uh, okay, I don't even myself benefit from my ethnic identity. I am an ethnic researcher. I do this type of stuff, and then I check the wrong answer <laughs> to my service. So that is a terrible situation. 
But, uh, okay, so the first issue is that the profile of exposure and experiences are very different and specific. And being uh, an immigrant, especially f first generation immigrant, is, uh, comes with a lot of adversity, social adversities. And being a Muslim, who many of those people are, also increases religion-related discrimination and all the exposures, especially in the current climate. So, uh, yes, I, um, unfortunately, even this is the thing, we, we know what exposure is happening and we know what is the solution, but still exposure is happening and solution is not being provided. That, that's the same situation with blacks or Hispanics, that we know there is a discrimination. We know that it is poverty which has a very particular type of solution. We know they do not get the same care or treatment, but we continue, despite knowing the situation, it's happening and continuing. So I think that is the same case for another ethnic minority to be added to the census uh, data collection. Is this on? Yes. It is? Okay. Um, I, so in our world, we have to collect um, lots and lots of demographics, and so we are now having to add more check boxes, um, you know, in, in all the things that we are required to track. The state did also implement a policy around um, that everyone within the CMH system, all of our providers need to, um, are required to go through cultural competency training. Um, so I think that those are kind of the be you know, the beginnings, which um, that then th those trainings will become more like robust as um, we continue to kind of track who is it that's hitting our systems and what do we need to do to add to those trainings. I'll add one more thing. Um, Trish may be too modest to to add this herself, but um, our community mental health organization here in Washtenaw County is a leader in um, finding ways to share data appropriate ways to share data with protections, but that are uh, sufficient for providers to know enough about their patients and to know enough about what their patients' challenges are to actually address them well. And um, Mike Harding in Trish's shop is, is um, a leader and somebody who we hold up all the time as really forward thinking and trying to be creative because of course there's that tension between privacy and having enough information for providers to really know what challenges their patients are dealing with. So I have a two-part question that's coming from two different people. They tied in together. So um, why has there been an increase in suicide rates among youth over the past six years? And what are some early interventions that could occur as to potentially later interventions? Well, I can start it off, and I'm sure others can add to it, but, you know, there are, it's probably multifactorial. We don't really know the answer, but, you know, some things that we think are occurring is uh, bullying has been shown to be a real strong determinant. Um, Facebook and other electronic um, media out there, you know, it's a lot of children and youth are going on and seeing what others are doing and feeling envious or um, feeling left out. They're using that as a way to communicate without really friendships, you know, talking. I, I don't know about you, I think I'm a lot older than many of you, but in my day, you know, I was on the telephone too much and, you know, using the telephone. And nowadays, I don't know about you, but the telephone in my home doesn't ring. In fact, my, many of us don't even have a landline anymore. So kids are, you know, just thinking that they're having friends, but they really don't. Uh, they're, they're, you know, they're doing video games and that friendship, those bonding, um, being in somebody's home where there's a parent, perhaps if they, they don't have a parent in their own home supervising, so kids are being unsupervised, um, coming very, a lot of activities after school, so they're tired and maybe they're not sitting around the dinner table talking about issues and problems. And so, you know, there are a range of issues. And then also the lack of perhaps preventive care that many children may not 
be able to uh, see a pediatrician or other physician who may be able to uh, screen for uh, depression and other issues in themselves or in their parents. So these are some of the issues, but probably not all of them. I think homelessness, poverty, all those issues are as, are as well major issues. Yeah, and I think what, what, um, what I can add is I, you know, we don't know what exactly um, is causing the increase in youth suicides. What I can tell you of the, um, of the deaths that we've seen here in Washington County, for CMH, our suicide rates for the people that we serve are extremely low, extremely, extremely low. And the suicides that we're seeing are not actually necessarily low income youths um, that we're seeing. So, you know, one of the things that we did for, um, after one of the uh, more recent, end of the summer suicides that had a tremendous impact, they all have a tremendous impact on our community, um, but one that um, happened in our, our local schools, um, you know, a lot of families come out to ask, like, you know, what am I supposed, how do I talk to my kid who was in his class? Or, you know, my younger, you know, the younger siblings go with the, their younger siblings, elementary, same elementary school or, or, what, or what have you. And what we also talked about, we had a psychologist come and also talk to these parents. And um, I know she, uh, Paula said I'm a nurse, but I, it's been so long since I've been a nurse, so nobody can have a medical emergency right now. Um, I've been an administrator for way too long. So, but what, you know, what I also kind of learned even in, in that session is that, you know, that the frontal lobe, correct me if I screw anything up, Paula, um, is kind of the part of your brain that makes you kind of like think before you do, and that that doesn't get fully developed until you are in your, in your 20s. And so combine that with social media and the kind of the, the culture of instant gratification. I mean, you got to send that text back right away. You have to, I mean, and so you're almost, it's almost like we're pouring fuel on, you know, an underdeveloped think before you do um, part of the brain. And so I think between the bullying and the social media and the culture of instant gratification, like must respond, must respond, that that is all playing into what we're seeing. But interestingly enough, our, our low-income folks, the other, the other piece, I think, is that culturally, I mean, I think, you know, I don't know, you know, if they're still talking about it, but every, it's a culture of everybody wins, everybody gets a trophy. You know, one of the things that we also kind of talk about is that the folks that we serve, because they're, they've been living in poverty or that they're pretty resilient. And so is there also, are we building kind of a culture where our youths are not even are, are, are losing some of that resilience because maybe the, the worst thing that could happen to someone is when they get their you know they get their heart broken for the first time and you know what are all the previous experience that happened to that so I think that there's also a piece of the culture around resilience um, that also you know could potentially play a factor in all this but we're trying to figure this out <laughs> And if I can add just briefly, if you look at the trend of psychiatric disorders over the past five decades or four decades, there is an increasing trend. So the, the, that those type of increases are not new and are not specific to suicide. Overall, they are increasing. And then the second one is that the structure of the family and also function of the family is changing. So the more families are single-headed, and now the conversations are less, or the type of social support. So the trend in a structure and function of family over the past decades would result in, uh, of course, that increase in mental health problems, including su suicide. I mean, the other aspect is the substance problems, substance use and dependence and the opioid crisis. And so often that's in adults, right? So often they have children. So. Um, so we're seeing that as a widespread national pr problem, which has a lot of tentacles into society. Okay. Um, okay, so this is a long one. <laughs> okay, is it fair to say that conservative legislators and policymakers believe that mental health problems are more of a family and personal issue to be addressed by support systems gained through individuals, families, and churches, or private community organizations, um, matter, uh, rather than society uh, of large government, uh, larger government infrastructures. So I guess the question is, uh, is or, yeah, that was the question. <laughs> <laughs> if I can start, 
the, the, the whole ideology of right, and especially extreme right, that the person is responsible, and nothing is more than res individual responsibility. So if there is a problem, then we should be able to see the cause, like a parent is absent, or the per something is wrong with the person, so it's the blaming the person. So this is a ideology, but at the same thing with poverty. So the right is, uh, has the belief that the poor is doing something wrong or something immoral is with the poor. So that is a part of the ideological view of a part, a big part of this country. Yeah, it's a really complicated question. I think it's very hard to look into the minds and the hearts of um, uh, any politician. Um, I will say that the more conservative policies that have really been challenging the Medicaid expansion um, and are, are really important for us to think about. Uh, the reason I say this is that Medicaid is the major payer for mental health services. And um, people with mental health uh, and substance use needs are very expensive. There's a, about 20% of the people in, uh, who are covered by Medicaid uh, have a, a mental health or substance use is issue and uh, we spend about half of our Medicaid dollars on those individuals. And so you can see with this problem, this disproportionate problem, that any time we uh, make really significant changes to the Medicaid program, like ending the Medicaid expansion in the 30 plus states who have expanded, or you know, adjusting from the way we currently pay for this entitlement program to something that is limited uh, to a per capita cap or to a block grant uh, type of funding, we really start to threaten our ability um, for those particular low, indiv low income individuals to get the um, mental health and substance use services that they need. So I think without looking into hearts and minds, um, we can say that certain policies are more challenging for the very people who need these services. You know, would anybody suggest, suggest that cancer should be treated by the family? Yet, for some reason, we, you know, it's hard for some people, some maybe legislators, to think that depression and bipolar illnesses or medical conditions, just as Trish said, the brain. These are brain illnesses. So, you know, this is why public education and fora like this are so important because, you know, this is not about just toughening up and doing better. This is about, this is about treatment, and this is why you have to get a proper diagnosis, legitimate diagnosis, and get evidence-based treatment. I'm so sorry to say we're out of time. Uh, and I know we haven't gotten to many of your questions. We've talked about so many different things today. We've talked about prevention and social aspects of that. We've talked about diagnosis and treatment. We've talked about community mental health issues, public policy. Again, I'm, I apologize we didn't get to all of your questions. We are having a reception uh, right outside of this room, uh, and the panelists will be staying around so we can have some more informal discussions for those of you who are here. And also, I do want to mention that right outside the door here, there is a table uh, and a staff member from the Depression Center here at the University of Michigan with some resources. If anyone wants to talk about what's available here um, at the University of Michigan Depression Center, we do have some information there. Thank you so much for joining us, and please join me in uh, thanking our wonderful panelists for the day. Thank you.